There's an old saying, do not judge a book by its cover. If you saw this book, you may not be interested in picking it up and reading it. The cover looks dull and unexciting. But what if I told you that this was the latest Harry Potter book? You wouldn't care what the cover looked like. Your view of the book would change completely. I bet you'd be racing to read it. So often we make a judgement within just a few seconds. Probably the biggest purchase in people's lives is buying a house, but did you know that the average time it takes to make this key decision is just eight minutes? How can you even have seen around inside in this space of time? I wonder how many people regret their decision once they've really found out the good and bad points about the property. We also make snap judgments about situations. We gather a few details and presume we know the full story. Have you ever jumped to conclusions only to find out later that you did not have all the important information? If only we waited to find out a fuller story. Terrible misjudgments may have been avoided. Listen to the Welsh myth of the legend of Gellert. Many years ago, in a castle deep in the rugged mountains of Snowdonia, in the county of Gwynedd, lived a brave and well-respected prince called Clewellyn. This prince loved to hunt, and his favourite hunting dog was a faithful and fearless hound called Gellert. Gellert accompanied Llewellyn everywhere and was always to be found at the head of the pack. No bird or animal was too big, too strong or too fierce for Gellert, whose bravery knew no bounds. This prince had a beloved son, a little baby whose mother had died in childbirth. Llewellyn had loved his wife dearly and been broken hearted by her death. His only consolation had been his son. On her deathbed, Clewellyn had promised his wife that he would cherish the boy, and this he did. He looked forward to the day when the two of them could ride out together, tracking the wolves and the other wild animals found in the ancient hills and the dark forests of Gwynedd in those far off days. One day, Clewellyn and his men were preparing to go out hunting. The baby lay fast asleep in his cradle. The day was cold and damp, but a huge log fire blazed in the bedchamber and the cradle was covered with warm furs. The baby was safe and snug. Nevertheless, Clewellyn decided to leave his loyal hound, Gellert, to protect the homestead. As he left, he gently stroked the dog's huge, shaggy head. Guard him well, Gellert, he said, until I return. Gellert's tail thumped the ground slowly, and his eyes remained on his master's face until Llewellyn softly closed the door behind him. It was late when the prince returned home. He was tired but victorious. A sumptuous feast was being prepared and he strode through the great hall towards the bedchamber, eager to see his son and relax in front of the great fire. But as he entered the room, he beheld a terrible sight. Furniture lay upturned, tapestries had been ripped from their hangings and the baby's cradle lay empty on the floor. The luxurious furs that had previously covered the cradle lay scattered nearby, torn to shreds and smeared with blood. As Llewellyn stood rooted to the spot, he felt a soft, warm, velvety nose nuzzle the palm of his hand. He looked down to see Gellert's trusting eyes gazing up at him. The dog looked exhausted but wagged his tail weakly. His head and paws were stained with blood. You wicked creature, roared the prince. 
This dog has killed my son. And without further ado, he drew his dagger and plunged it deep into Gellert's side. The dog slumped to the ground as the prince heard a soft whimpering from behind the upturned cradle. As the dog lay dying, Llewellyn gently picked up his son. Too late, he turned to see the half-covered body of a huge wolf lying dead on the floor. Clearly, the wolf had tried to attack the baby boy, but thanks to Gellert, the baby remained unharmed. Filled with remorse, Llewellyn knelt and gently stroked his faithful friend, and Gellert's tail thumped the ground slowly for the last time. Gellert's body was buried outside the castle walls close to the river. The huge stone slab inscribed with Gellert's name still marks the grave, and the village nearby still carries the name Beth Gellert, Gellert's grave. Unfortunately, we also jump to conclusions about people just as easily. How they look, how they dress, how they speak, how they act, their mannerisms, and if they seem different to us. A famous example of this happened during the popular television show, Britain's Got Talent, in 2009. Hi, what's your name, darling? My name is Susan Boyle. Okay, uh, Susan, and where are you from? I am from Blackburn, near Bathgate, West Lothian. It's a big town. It's a sort of collection of, it's a collection of uh, villages. I to think there. And how old are you, Susan? I am 47. <laughs> and that's just one side of me. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what's the dream? I, I'm trying to be a professional singer. And why hasn't it worked out so far, Susan? I've never been given the chance before, but here's hoping it'll change. Okay, and who would you like to be as successful as? Elaine Page. Elaine like Page. That. What are you going to sing tonight? I'm going to sing I Dreamed a Dream from the Miserables. Okay. Big song. <laughs> yeah? Yes. Yeah. I dreamed a dream in time gone by One You did much better, did you? Did you? No. I dreamed that love would never die I dreamed that love would be forgotten That was the biggest surprise I have had in three years on this show. When you stood there with that cheeky grin and said, I, I want to be like a lame page, everyone was laughing at you. No one is laughing now. That was... Susan, you are a little tiger, aren't you? No, I don't know about that. You are? I don't know about that. Okay, moment of truth. Here's yes or no. The biggest yes I have ever given anybody. <laughs> Amanda? Yes, definitely. Brilliant. Amanda, it's you! Susan Boyle, you can go back to the village with your head held high. It's three S's. Yeah. What do you think the audience and the judges were expecting? Why do you think they thought Susan Boyle would not be a good singer? How have the judges and the audience changed their opinion after hearing Susan Boyle sing? Perhaps the biggest misjudgment that is made is to assume how intelligent someone is 
dependent on whether or not they have a disability. Who would have thought that this man has been hailed the greatest mind of our time? Stephen Hawking was born on the 8th of January 1942 in Oxford and although nicknamed Einstein at school, he wasn't always successful academically and was slow to learn to read. He quickly made up for this slow start and after studying physics and chemistry at Oxford, where he was bored because he found the work ridiculously easy, and despite receiving the devastating news that he was suffering from motor neuron disease at the age of 21 years old, he went on to make incredible discoveries, culminating in his world-famous book, A Brief History of Time. After being given a diagnosis that would have suggested a very short life, Stephen Hawking went on to live a further 55 years, dying on the 14th of March 2018 and leaving the world with some of the greatest insights into physics. On trying to understand. Remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist. On being diagnosed with motor neuron disease. My expectations were reduced to zero when I was 21. Everything after that has been a bonus. On the importance of a sense of humour. Life would be tragic if it weren't so funny. On what he thinks about all day. Women, they're a complete mystery. On an imperfect world, without imperfection, you and I wouldn't exist. On intelligence, those who boast about their IQ are losers. On fame, the downside of my celebrity is that I cannot go anywhere in the world without being recognised. It's not enough for me to wear dark sunglasses and a wig. The wheelchair gives me away. On death. I've lived with the prospect of an early death for the last 49 years. I'm not afraid of death, but I'm in no hurry to die. Quotation. As human beings, we suffer from an innate tendency to jump to conclusions, to judge people too quickly, and to pronounce them failures or heroes without due consideration. Prince Charles. <laughs>